Thank you last event, and we're so grateful for all of you to be here with us together. It becomes so wonderfully colorful with all of you. Um, we did an experiment this morning, and we, I asked Pat to help us with it, which is to do sessions up the maroon bells, which is what you who are from here know how extraordinary that is. And, and she did a talk with Carrie Walton Penner of, of Walton uh, Family Foundation, and she was a little grumbly about it and grumpy last night. <laughs> this morning, she said that it was really magnificent. So. Um, so that's why I think it's uh, afternoon already, because <laughs> But it's my honor to uh, introduce all of you guys to this session, which is a really special one on building a caregiving society. My name is Peggy Clark with the Aspen Institute. <coughs> We're delighted you all are here. Um, this session is with two incredible women. The conversation between Pat and Sheila is really very, very special on building a caregiving society. Um, I'd like to just introduce Pat Mitchell, who's a Force of nature, hard to introduce Pat, there's a lot going on in the regular bio. But let me just tell you a little bit of what Pat was the first female CEO and head of um, PBS, um, PBS Media. She was um, the chair of CNN, she was the head of the Paley Center, she has more than 20 uh, Emmy Awards. Um, I'm not going to get the number right, and also beat several Pilates. But most importantly, she <coughs> really, really believes in looking hard at um, what we're doing with society and our responsibilities to each other, um, particularly women. And when um, I talked to her about what we're doing with Care.com here and the caregiving track and thinking about relooking and care in a new way, that's said I'd love to do this talk. So Pat, we're honored to have you. We're Thank you. honored to have you. It's a great to have you partner. Welcome. Thanks Thank so Thank you. And I was only grumbly. Thank you. I just feel like I need to explain the grumbleness. Um, it, it was only because she told me about midnight as we were having dinner. Oh, by the way, the pickup is 610. <laughs> no, and, and also it's 43 degrees. Uh, and uh, so neither Carrie nor I were, were dressed properly, but they brought blankets along. And I would highly recommend. Are there any other Maroon Bell sessions? There aren't this I time. We just try this All right, well, then so but next year it's a must because to talk about the environment in that particular environment with the Rocky Mountains behind us is quite extraordinary. And it uh, reminded me, actually, on the way back as I was thinking about this conversation, how after just a couple of days, Peggy, and uh, at Spotlight Health, you can actually begin to believe that we live in a compassionate and caregiving society. But in actuality, we don't. We live where the need for caregiving is greater than ever and growing every day. 10,000 of us turning 65 and over every single day. So the need for caregiving grows for um, the parents who are beginning life with children, partners who are dealing with disabled, people in, in their family, as well as this enormous growing need for elder care. And in this landscape, the US is not doing very well. We lag way behind many, many other countries in creating compassionate public policy, uh, businesses with the kind of work-life balance and, and health care benefits that are necessary. And we like the infrastructure and accessibility to health care, in particular to caregiving options. And that's why in 2006, this amazing entrepreneur who already had an extraordinary career sat down, I assume, with a piece of paper and started to think about, here's the problem, caregiving. How do we provide caregiving and take care of the enormous caregiving population? and improve it for both the caregiver and the caregivers. Sheila Marcella, ladies and gentlemen, the founder, <laughs> founder and CEO of care.com. You see this need that even in 2006 was obvious to you, maybe not so clear to people who were making uh, policies around caregiving, how did you, what did you look at and decide this is one solution to a growing problem? Thanks, Pat. First of all, I have to tell you, I'm a little nervous. I do this a lot, but to be interviewed by somebody who I so much honor. Oh, thank you. I, I feel like I should be around. 
<laughs> no, not at all. Thank you. Um, so, really started with personal, a personal um, plight that I had. I was born and raised in the Philippines and came to the United States for college. Met my husband in college and we got pregnant at a very young age between my sophomore and junior year. Um, and realized, because my parents were in the Philippines, we didn't really have a lot of help. And um, to top it all off, my husband's parents were deceased. So we didn't really have resources to go find care. And I found as I went through my career, at the time I was teaching at Harvard Business School, um, I started to grade, in, grade internet business plans. And I decided that I didn't really have a lot of experience and operational experience to build internet companies. Um, and joined a company called You Promise, and you'll see this in my career, and this is about helping families save money for college. Mm -hmm. And while I was at that company, um, my father um, came to the United States to actually help um, take care of our younger son. Who we also got pregnant in grad school. So now we have two kids struggling in grad school in our careers. And my father was carrying a baby Adam up the stairs and fell backwards and had a heart attack. And so I was 29 years old and defined between um, child care and senior care, and that's what we say is the sandwich generation. Mm -hmm. um, and I love how Sarita calls it a panini. Uh, but um, really stuck with trying to figure things out. And here I was working in an internet company, but yet I was using the yellow pages to look for care. And so something didn't seem to add up for me. And I thought, like, use my experience, knowledge of business, and find ways to help other families. Because if I was going through the, the struggle of child care and senior care, I knew millions of other families were going through it. And as I searched, um, the newspapers, uh, pretty much classifieds, were going out of business. Um, churches and libraries of eight and a half by 11 with a little ear that you tear off were sort of the remaining channels to look for care. And certainly child care resources, referral agencies with child care aware, th those were always available too, but it, was, but it was sort of a needle in a haystack. And often when you're knocking next door with your neighbor and she may be um, you know, at, at an age where her kids are going to school and her nanny's available, may not necessarily meet your needs because you know, we're ethnically Filipino, and it was important for me, especially caring for my father, to have somebody who speaks Tagalog, even though there might be a Spanish-speaking nanny who's available for my friend next door. So it, there just wasn't real options. And I found that um, trying to build something, and I remember people telling me, like, you're crazy. It's so fragmented. This is never going to work as a business. And the debate around being a nonprofit or for-profit, the reality is the only way to build something at scale it had to be a capitalist company. And we've raised $260 million to date, but we're only making a very small dent, as you pointed out, that, that we've got a broken care infrastructure. A very small dent, though, because you know, you're collecting a community of people who are not accustomed to working in a business environment or thinking of themselves as a business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yet, I read that you have 8 million, is that right, caregivers? online, and just to put in that perspective, Uber had about two million before this last uh, <laughs> <laughs> possible deletion. Um, but, but the eight million caregivers are currently enrolled, so how does that work for them? What does care.com provide for the caregivers? I think the most important thing is really access to jobs, and it's jobs that are fulfilling, because we take it seriously, and we believe it's our responsibility and our role. Uh, to make sure that caregivers are, are, are you know, finding jobs that, that provide a livable wage. And we very early on partnered with Ai Jin Poo, and she's here in the audience with NDWA. Very proud of, I will say, she's been an inspiration to me. Um, there are many times where uh, we would have a meal together, and I have said to her, I deal with zeros and ones and bits and binary things. She deals in the front line with real people, and it's important for me to understand the real stories behind these people. And that's really uh, what blossomed into a partnership and encouraged us to, uh, at care.com, to um, you know, make sure that every, every job that's posted is above minimum wage. Um, started for us, to, we started to invest in making sure that we uh, provided household payroll. We bought one of the largest household payroll companies, now called HomePay, some of us. Some clients in the audience who shared it with me yesterday. Um, we also provide workers' compensation. That took us about four years to bring together and broker a bunch of brokers to provide uh, access to workers' comp in all 50 states. And then um, last year, uh, we proudly launched the first ever pooled portable benefits. 
mm -hmm. uh, platform, uh, allowing um, <coughs> caregivers to move around whoever they're working with, uh, with a prepaid card that we sweep money into so that they can pay for premiums, pharmacy, gas, and different things um, so that they're taking care of themselves. And that's a portion that we provide, as well as families. And, and friends of mine call this sort of conscious capitalism. How do we make sure that we're, we're thoughtful? And, and part of this was really also inspired by my son. You know, he had told me about an instance where he was in a ride-sharing uh, <laughs> company in a ride uh, with friends who, who then proudly came back and said, that was so cheap. Can you imagine? That ride was so cheap. And then Ryan, my son, turned to, to his friends and said, except that it was off of the back of that driveway. Mm -hmm. You know, I get that it's cheap for us, but we can afford to pay a little bit more because this driver is struggling. My own son shared, shared that with me years ago, and it made me suddenly realize that what more could we be doing for caregivers? And of course, with our partnership with NDWA and, and um, Jobs and Justice and Caring Across Generations, really learned a lot about what we need to be doing more. And you have been doing this work now since 2006. And what are, what are the lessons that you've learned in these years about what is the need on both sides of the equation? And then what, how has that led to what you're focusing on now? Yeah, to, you know, what's really interesting is to scale uh, care infrastructure, especially if you're building a for-profit company. We were very focused in the beginning of building density um, and, and building market share. And uh, we, we spent a lot in marketing. A lot, lot of marketing, television ads, online, digital um, search engine, to really grow the overall brand awareness and to build trust within the community that we were building um, something that was going to meet their needs. And so for a long time, it was all about providing families choice. And so we didn't prioritize the caregivers as much because at that point, it was just a volume-based game to try and make sure that we could do the reach and win ubiquity across the country. And now we're below over in 20 countries. Um, and then a few years ago, um, and the mission had always been, how do we professionalize caregiving? And so you heard all the things that we needed to do to make sure that the caregivers are well taken care of because there's a supply constraint problem that we're going to run into. And you want to make sure that this job is something that can actually be sustainable for caregivers because our country depends upon them. It really depends on this care infrastructure. But of course, as you invest, in, in caregivers, and there's a movement to fight for 15 and all those right things that need to happen to sustain caregivers, we've got to come up with solutions on the other side of the marketplace because the other dilemma we have is that care is becoming more and more expensive. How do you make that affordable? And so although we might be the cheapest option out there compared to, say, a Craigslist or other um, uh, options through word of mouth, because we're $40 a month or $120 a year, it's still expensive for, for many families to access and find great care. Mm -hmm. So we're coming up with, with new solutions. We've got a program now that we're excited to pilot called HomeStart. And that idea is how do we um, um, make sure that we can work with nonprofits <coughs> to fund and support licensing of family day caregivers in the community. And we've learned through our partner, uh, All Our Kin, that for every dollar that you invest, in a family day caregiver, often an immigrant, minority woman, in, in changing her, her own home to modify it to run her own business, she's giving $20 back to the community, which is phenomenal. So we're trying to find programs like that. We're piloting those programs now, but we're very interested in finding solutions to actually scale that. Um, and so I've got a great team. We're constantly brainstorming other ways, because we're at a place now where We've got awareness, we've got trust in the marketplace, and it's beyond density. It's, it's how do we find real solutions that can work for families to, to solve the problems in this country. But two big barriers you've already overcome, trust, yeah. which was huge yeah. to build, both with the caregiving community and those seeking care, um, and, the, and then to build the awareness mm -hmm. of the campaign. So now as you look forward, you, you must be looking uh, at a couple of different areas. One, certainly, how does care.com impact national policy mm -hmm. on these issues? Mm -hmm. And if you look at the current budget and the health care bill mm -hmm. uh, under consideration, doesn't look very good for either side of that equation. So uh, where does... Where's cares.com's work there? You know, it's, it's not an easy one, and I think I shared this with you uh, over coffee yesterday. It's, it's been actually quite an emotional 
um, um, past year for me, and uh, I share this with some close friends. Um, we were very much uh, working very closely with um, uh, the Hillary uh, potential administration at the time, worked closely with um, Secretary uh, Labor Perez through our partnerships with IGEN, and, and just had a game plan overall and a rollout on uh, professionalizing caregiving more and the kinds of policies that we supported. And of course, um, there was a tough loss. And I was at Javits that night, and my cousin, who had no idea that you know running a public company as a CEO is probably not a good idea to post a picture of me that she saw on CNN online um, and posted it on Facebook. And at that point, you know, uh, I, I had tweets, I had friends asking about it, and I said, okay, so it's out. I obviously am a, a big supporter because I try and separate my public and, and personal stuff, especially uh, when it came to the election. And it was a real struggle for me coming back. Uh, to the company since a majority of the women in the company, a majority of the employees were women, and and I got started to get emails of how disappointed everybody was, and this, and I came back on a on a Wednesday morning, and I I couldn't even get the words out. I, it was such an emotional thing for me, and it's this I'm sharing this more as the journey I went through rather than anyone's uh, political um, side that you picked. It was just a tough one. And, and then that Friday, I thought that I could muster the strength already spoke in front of the company, and I just bawled, uh, you know. And, and I remember standing, and I decided I was going to use a symbolic thing and said, I got to take a grip here. And I, I, I was crying, standing on the left. And I quickly wiped my tears and I said, now I'm going to move over here. This is the personal Sheila, who, by the way, you know, bought incredible shoes by Ivanka, and I was then debating returning it. Like, that's how personal, it was just, you know, I'm grappling through this. I had half, there's six of us in the family, half my siblings uh, voted for Trump, and I, I was dealing with a lot personally. And then I said, now I'm gonna turn it over to the professional Sheila. And the professional Sheila says, we owe it to this country, we serve everybody equally, and we've gotta find a way to make sure that all our personal turmoil, we don't blog about because we serve everybody, caregivers, families, and it doesn't matter what our political beliefs are, and I'm setting that aside, despite what you're seeing here. And that wasn't easy. And of course, then a month later, I had dinner with, with Ivanka, and I had to as a leader. It was tough, I remember having a conversation with Ijin about it even before um, doing it, and, and, and the, the, just, it was difficult. But why? Because she decided to take the torch and fight for childcare. And yet that was so important that, that I could use and leverage the business voice to have somebody in government listen to something that's so important for families, despite how I was feeling. And so working with her, I didn't necessarily agree with um, the tax uh, credits or the, the tax deductions that they were recommending, because I was actually in favor of more credits to make sure it was more mass market appeal. Uh, but, but that was, it was critical. And then, by the way, a week later, uh, the executive order on the immigration ban came out. And then there was another thing that I had to go through. Here I am trying to develop a relationship with this new administration, but that came to be a moral issue for us. That I was one of the first CEOs that signed a letter and just said, you know what, we're against this, despite the fact that we could risk um, the Trump administration listening to our voice with regards to child care policy. So it's, 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 not, it, it's not an easy um, uh, situation being a public company CEO, and yet you realize the role that you have to play to represent not just the company and your shareholders, but really to represent families in doing what's best. I so appreciate your sharing that story for a couple of reasons. Um, I think there are many other people in this room who probably understand the personal and the professional dilemmas that in particular business leaders are journalists or people who um, you know, are, are expected to maintain a certain neutrality. And, and certainly when it comes to policies that are, are, are part of the, of the work going forward. And it also indicates how treacherous this ground is as we try and make progress. And so I'm wondering now, months into this, after the, you know, as you said, take stepping across the differences in opinion and reaching out to the new administration, hoping that there'd be a delivery of, of real compassionate domestic policy mm -hmm. in regards to this. 
Um, how are you feeling now, and how do you feel you can, what, what position can care.com take in this to advocate for the right results on, on health care, the health care legislation, yeah, for example? Yeah, I think we continue to use our business voice. I certainly disagree with the Medicaid cuts and um, the impact that will have on millions and millions of people. Um, and the fact that the states are really going to struggle in Massachusetts alone, I think, um, 40% of our, our budget that's federally funded is Medicaid, and that's pretty large, and, that, and they're very feel, fearful. I'm on the board of Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, we talk about that as well, and it will impact, um, really impact poor children. And we take great pride as a hospital to be able to serve um, children and, and to actually impact even the advancement of our research. So I, I, I very much feel it in our community and the impact that will have on people. Um, I do think that um, you know removing the subsidies, especially for middle income, and, and taking it away from from being able to fund the tax dollars through higher income. Where else are we going to get the money to support each other? Um, so I do worry about that, and I, I think that uh, my business voice can can lend a hand, um, and I believe it is uh, our responsibility and our role to speak up. And you and Ajin and so many other business leaders have done that. Uh, uh, now, before we leave this entirely, though, what about the immigration ban? Because there's probably no population of, of workers in this country more directly affected. Yeah, we continue to, to really um, uh, be against that. And I'm thankful for the legal system um, twice in a row uh, for um, keeping the executive branch in check. Um, so I'm thankful for that, that we've got systems to be able to handle that. But I agree with you. I, I think that um, caregivers, gosh, a huge, huge percentage of them are um, immigrants, uh, women, vulnerable. Uh, and if it wasn't the work of NDWA and Jobs of Justice and Caring Across Generations, um, ARP and other organizations that fight for the rights of caregivers, um, uh, I think it would be really hard. So, yeah. Well, thank you for your voice and your advocacy on this. Um, so turning, and, and we'll open up for questions, so I'm sure that conversation probably raised some in your mind, so hold on for just a minute, because I want to move um, also to one of the things that you also have led in, Sheila, which is looking at innovative solutions to these problems. I mean, if we can't look to government for everything. We know that always. Um, compassionate policies would be great. But then how, where do you see around the world other caregiving solutions that are working well? Certainly they're, what, 35 percent of, I mean, a lot of countries are ahead of us right. in solving uh, these issues of elder care and caregiving. So what, what solutions are are yeah, on your mind and so impressive. We're, we're actually super excited. Um, Latoya Murphy, who's our, our chief of staff, has joined us because um, it's hard to juggle running a, a public company at the same time being super passionate about CSR. So she, she's in charge of that. Uh, we'll be launching the Cure Institute, which is a 501c3. We're doing that broadly again, partnerships with AARP and some medical uh, professionals. And we're super excited to get that launched. And it's actually, think about it as the DMV uh, for care and care industry. Uh, and we're trying to find uh, public-private solutions to do that um, and, and led by some, some pretty terrific foundations. We're going to hold off when that is announced, but, but we are, we're launching it this summer, so we're, we're excited about that. What's great is we're trying to find, um, uh, you know, how do we create international accreditation around the curriculum of quality when we train caregivers. Mm -hmm. um, so we're partnering uh, with the international um, labor unions. Uh, we're sharing about Burroughs, who's like leading that up. I'm actually headed to Brussels next week to really develop a set of standards for training curriculum. And that's curriculum's coming out of Australia, India, and really <coughs> ways in which we can study how do we train caregivers with programs around the world, not just the United States. And I think the United States has great training programs. Um, and we've partnered with Zero to Three, we've partnered with Child Care Aware, and other nonprofits. We're trying to find other programs as well that can really reach very vulnerable, low-income populations and programs that um, are that can also scale. Uh, and we're working on that with Sharon Burroughs, so we're excited about that. And when you look at the, the rest of the world and you see how in many countries, and in particular we think of the Nordic countries, who have either put government policies or in many cases business, 
policies too. So how do you work with your colleagues in the, in the corporate world, in the workforce, to encourage a different approach to um, their, their health care and their family leave and all of the other ways in which they offer benefits to families for caregiving? So what's interesting is I find that there's such this strong integration with our CSR and our pursuit of uh, a business that we call Care at Work. Uh, in fact, the Home Start program that I mentioned, we're starting that with some key partners within our Care at Work program. I'm not mm -hmm. ready to announce that yet, but, and we provide through our Care at Work enterprise service um, uh, employee benefits, care benefits that includes access to the uh, online product that, that we provide 10 million families consumer access to, we do senior care planning, we have concierge services, and then we also have uh, backup care, and we provide that in, in numerous countries. And that, I often describe to people, we're able to have Maria or Mary Poppins show up within a couple hours when there's a crisis in somebody's home, and we do that for our employee base. What's great about engaging those partners as, so it's interesting that we have access to and a voice from consumers, but we also have the ear and of our clients in the business sector mm -hmm. uh, and involving them. Uh, examples of uh, bringing together HBS and PwC uh, to develop a care economy white paper that both organizations did pro bono uh, because they believe in it so much. So we're trying to leverage as much as we can our access to the business sector to influence and to create advocacy and, and leverage the voice of our partners because they themselves care deeply about their employees. You heard Lloyd Dean uh, from Dignity Health talk about his six, 60,000 employees and how it's important for him to make sure that he's providing benefits. So it's raising that level of awareness. And what's great is, I mean, our very first client who's here, they're doing Facebook Live, is Facebook. And, um, and I remember having that uh, first conversation with Care at Work and, and saying um, to Cheryl and the HR team, you know, what do you think? Should we white label at the time? They said, no, it's care.com. Consumers know care.com. And for companies like Facebook to say in Google, to say that we care deeply about our employees and we're providing care.com creates a natural advocacy <coughs> that's authentic, that's coming from the company because they're providing it as a benefit. So, um, so we're using that power and it really dovetails nicely with our CSR and our mission of our company. And as you say, the, the data and the research is so conclusive on this. Yes. I mean, happier employees, yes. less absentee time, less sick days. I mean, yes. all that data has actually been out there for some time. Yes. So this, this offers companies a, a way to respond. Exactly. And, and so if you read the testimonials of the caregivers who are in the system of care.com as well as the people you are providing the care for, I mean, they're quite extraordinary. And uh, I don't know if all of you are aware that didn't you provide caregiving services to children here? Yes. 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 Well, I mean, we <laughs> yeah, first time yes. ever, right? Yes. First time I've been to a conference in a very long time where uh, where children were in fact. It's not a, easy. <laughs> and to get well, I, well, I, well, I wondered I might be bringing up something, but, but I ran into a great, as they say, a grateful parent um, uh, on the sidewalk coming in, and he said, please tell Sheila how much I appreciate the care that my, my children have gotten. It matters. And, and some of you may know that there's a new political party in uh, Britain, and it's spreading actually to other countries in the US, the Women's Equality Party. And the very first thing they did as a platform for the party was care. provide care, child care, for every woman who chose to run for office. And as a result, they mounted what was it, something like 37 campaigns in the UK. They came in third in the mayor's race, and they showed very well. I mean, with no party, you know, no, no, no party headquarters, but they had one platform, and that was candidates, and particularly women, but often men, too, who want to run for office need the child care services. Yesterday morning, um, HBS and PwC kicked off sort of this care economy research that they did, but it really shows that the data the last 40 years, what has drawn GDP, and some of you went to that, some of this sound a little repetitive, is, is really female participation in the workplace. I mean, we're hearing about women running for government, but just trying to have uh, contributions towards economic growth, you can't have women work without great care. There's such this incredible codependency. 
and, and if it's 50% of our population, I mean, Japan now, their entire economic policies are on womenomics, abenomics. Mm -hmm. Abe's even adopted it now. Yeah. Right? And, and you, we've got to invest in the care infrastructure, including your investment. So Peggy was thrilled when we decided to do this. But to really also bring that out is how do we respect Right? And so we, we have a booth over there, and we decided to highlight, because the spotlight is on caregiving, at the end of it, what really matters isn't our voice at care.com. I mean, we help. But it's really how do we elevate the voices of the caregivers behind what happens. So this is a people-specific industry. It really is about the caregivers. And it's um, important, too, to recognize that when if it is a priority, and it should be for all of us to take care of, of our parents, our children, I mean, it is a priority, um, then it takes leaders like Peggy, who stood up and said, no, we're going to have this, uh, and to fight for it. Because it doesn't happen just naturally. It's not part of the plan. Uh, in fact, I don't think caregiving is a part of anybody's oh, kind of plan, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, none of us expect to be where you are, taking care of an elderly a parent with an injury and children, and uh, and it, and that's evolving in in almost every life that I know. So I'm going to open it up to the to the lives in this room now for your questions for Sheila. Just raise your hand, and we have a mic headed your way. Hi, is it on? Hello. Yeah. Hi, I'm Marie Kennedy. I'm with Dignity Health. Um, I, I know Sheila and everybody else, and. Um, my comments are more from my personal life, just like you. OK, here's my dignity health role, and here's my Marie Kennedy role. And um, I'm just fascinated by all the work you're doing, because I have been a working mother my entire career. I uh, supported four kids as a single wage earner. A few years ago, life was very different. Um, but I was fortunate, because I could dig deep. I never wanted to add up what I paid for childcare because I didn't want to know. Um, <laughs> I didn't. And I struggled with all those really tough decisions. I did nanny shares. I mean, I did every version of childcare you can imagine. Um, and I remember making those tough decisions about do we, do we pay our nanny's vacation? Do we do payroll? I mean, all those really tough decisions. And not a lot of help out there. So I just have to say I'm so excited about what you're doing. It's just really phenomenal. And um, I, I do know that in our world, okay, now I'm Dignity Health again, and in our world, we have a lot of caregivers that don't, aren't, you know, they're pretty well compensated. We have great benefits, but they still go home at night and struggle. Like, how do they, how do they pay for all this? So I just, just two questions, and you may have addressed them and I missed it, but, um, you know, for every wage earner, there's just not enough, and I know you said you met with Ivanka, and there's not enough tax benefit and tax incentives. You know, all my childcare was not, all I could do was use my FSA, and that was pretty limited. I think it was maybe $5,000, yeah. and I mean, I was paying significant money, especially at, I had one point in life where my, my older daughters are my stepchildren, so I had quite a range. I had a 14-year range, so I had a number of years in my life where I had every kid somewhere else. They were not the age ranges where they could all be in the same place. Um, and then, um, and, the, and the benefits out there were just so limited for me, like I couldn't write any of that off. So I, I would just say, from that perspective, you know, what can we do to help you make sure that everybody is getting some kind of tax break? Um, and then just the last, well, a second follow-up, pardon? Vote. But, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll start with that because that needs to happen, right? Didn't somebody tell us last night that 70% of the population watches reality TV, but the yeah. number of people that voted much, was... Much less than yeah. that vote, right. Okay, and then just follow up. Love the collaborations you're doing. Can't solve this alone. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about how you're fundraising because I see you almost, you almost have to be the grantee to get these people to convene these collaborations so we can be a more powerful voice to get this work right. done. Thank and you sorry, to be so long. Yeah. sorry to be so long-winded. Thank you. So the big thing is really, I, I think that in, what's going to influence government is a powerful voice of business to show um, and to role model that care equals jobs. I think that when it starts to get tied to the economy and employment and growth, um, 
as opposed to any soft issues, because what happens is it becomes political <coughs> and values driven based. That there's there's this context of that women need to stay at home, and how dare anybody have a voice with regards to any decisions that are being made in the home. And 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 so instead of that being the conversation, we just basically take it out of the political sphere and say, do we all believe that jobs matter? Do we all believe that women contribute given their 50% of the population? And if so, how are we going to get women to work? They need care given as a society we expect women to care for children and their parents. Even a majority, and Alicia was here, a majority of, of caregivers, family caregivers are daughters or women. So it, it impacts us in, in, in our entire life cycle for women. So if we believe we depend on this very productive labor to society, then we need to support that just as much as we support roads and bridges to get people to work. And that nearly half of the working population is female. Yes. And if we were counting the ones we're not counting, they'd be even more. Uh, did you have your hand up, Peggy? Yeah, I'm just, sorry, I'm taking that. But, um, the, you know, the title of this is Building a Caregiving Society, which is a pretty big leap. And I'm conscious of the fact that at your suggestion, we had a really wonderful session with two CEOs, two female CEOs, Rose Macario of Patagonia and Sue Siegel of GE, and uh, with David Leonhardt of New York Times interviewing them. There are very few CEOs that are taking this caregiving issue on for their own employees. And I'm so delighted of the, to know you, Sheila, and like the other speaker, if, if you'd been around when I was a single mom, it would change my life. Let me tell you right now. And you were not. And so, but I see this powerful disruption you've done in the industry at the retail level. What happens next? How do we move it? Because if you only have two CEOs who are willing to stand up there and saying they're doing this, they're major corporations, and we're in a very difficult political environment, how do we get there? I changed my strategy a few years ago. Um, I was speaking at a lot of women's conferences talking about this care issue, and I started to realize I was preaching the choir. Mm -hmm. Everybody would nod their heads like, yep, yep, we're doing what we can for our part. Um, and I started to realize it was actually McKinsey put out a study and showed that um, majority of men, senior men, who were in the C-suite didn't think there was a disparity between uh, men and women uh, in the workplace. And the fact that if you're way up in the corner office and you don't think there's a problem, uh, then how are you helping overall? And that really then um, got me to really thinking, you know, and I, I had a, a, a very good relationship with HBS having graduated there and taught there for a little bit, um, decided that I would uh, speak with the dean and find a professor who um, would publish a paper. Uh, and we announced it here yesterday, uh, the results of that research, so that we could try it as a male professor, someone who believed in this as an economic issue, not a gender issue. Because of course, I could have gotten a, a, a very prominent female professor to go write it. Instead, we focused on someone um, in the competitiveness group of HBS under Michael Porter's group, and Joe Fuller agreed to do it, um, to write the paper so that it would target the Fortune 500s. And that when this paper would be published to target male CEOs to understand the economic argument behind care and the war for talent. And the fact that is, if you don't invest in care, you're going to lose out. That catches people's attention. Mm -hmm. And that the results of that research is actually showing that a majority of those concerned about their career are men, more than women. And they're often the highest income and has the highest title. Mm -hmm. Because they're, they're, they're concerned about being judged that if they have care issues in the home that's perceived by their either their bosses or their teams, that somehow they're going to be limited in their career trajectory. So if your most senior men are concerned about this, even though you might be providing the care benefit, which by the way economically shows that it you know, addresses, Pat mentioned, absenteeism and overall productivity, something is broken. And so it's imperative that we get this data out. And there are some partners we have here who are willing to join forces with us to support that research, to support the awareness building. We have whocares.org and a who cares campaign 
that we're trying to get out. It's now fully funded by us because it's very difficult. I will tell you, I spent a year with iGEN's help trying to raise money in whocares.org, and it's very difficult for foundations to fund awareness <coughs> campaigns. They're helping us fund our programs, but awareness campaigns are really tough. But to your point, Marie, it's got to be awareness for people yeah. to understand whether it's consumers who vote or it's the C-suite who role model and who, by the way, a majority are actual Republicans who then understand that this is an economic argument, not a values-based argument, of why we need to transform and, and make sure that we invest in the infrastructure. Yeah. You said the people at the top, I was like, yeah. Didn't, had care issues and they're embarrassed to admit it. I didn't understand that part. Um, so the research uh, actually showed when they surveyed that 70% um, uh, of those that responded, uh, it showed that they were mostly concerned about caregiving responsibilities compared to middle management. It was actually the most senior folks and the most senior titles in the company. That, themselves? About themselves. themselves. About themselves. And, and actually, Joe Fuller summarized it well. If you can imagine if you're a leader and you are concerned about how you're perceived, about your care, you know, whether or not you know you're caring enough for your family and, and, and taking time off, and you're you, you worry that that's gonna actually you're gonna be judged around your career trajectory, you can imagine, well then of course. Then what's your perception of, of your subordinates and your team? Yeah. The, the interesting thing, just for quick intervention. You much more to do than I <laughs> No, no, no uh, but, a, but a quick reminder maybe more than an intervention here is that part of the problem is that this research is there. It's, it, it's been there and it's getting better and better. The data is there that supports the case for all of this. Um, and we are, the reason that most of us, and maybe not in this room, because this is a very informed group of people, but certainly everywhere else, including among CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, it isn't information that is shared or known. And part of that has to do with the gap between real information and what the media delivers us. So I could move that into another whole conversation. <laughs> but in fact, it is the, the media does not report this story. I, I'm sure you must have this issue all the time. And when you're looking to build partnerships, which are essential to build a caregiving society, you've got to have partnerships across every sector. And that one, uh, so along with changing your media, your strategy about who you speak to, Sheila, where you spend your time, and I think that's a great shift, um, it, we have to find ways to get the media to understand the importance of, of this message, I too. I completely agree. It's, it's somehow, care is just not viewed sexy enough to, to write about or talk about. Mm -hmm. And yet it's everyone's it is problem. Everyone's okay. I can just tell that more story, because if you think of the yep. piece, right, that just came out in, Sorry, was it the New Yorker or Atlantic? I don't know. We have several hands, so I'm going to move quickly through. So just make it a question, please. Uh, we'll start there, and then we'll come back to the. Hi, two Katarina Dolston. I'm a doctor from Sweden, actually. So I had my kids in health in uh, care yeah, your in Sweden. Kids are healthy and everybody's yes. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> yes, yes. If you'd accept us, we'd all be there. But, please. Uh, um, but now I live in the U.S. and I worry about my oh. kids' kids, right? If they ever decide to get any. Um, but I wanted to say, like, just building on what you said about the CEOs, would they then, um, who do not acknowledge this problem, would they then also be prepared to tell their college girls, like, honey, it's no use you get that MBA because you're still going to stay home with your kids and then after 10 years it'll be impossible for you to get a job. I mean, that, I think the, to use that leverage is also maybe yeah. not as blunt as mine. Doctors are extremely influential. Yeah. I, I can tell you. And yeah. I've, I've met some male leaders who are enlightened of, of the way they're thinking about it for their daughters in the future of. Of, of yeah, it, it, there has been a recent study done that the men who are the greatest allies on all women's policies are CEOs who have daughters. Yes. So we have to give them a lot of credit. Two more questions here, you, you, and then this gentleman here. Hi, uh, my name is Margie Scott and I'm a millennial working mom of four and a very grateful customer of um, care.com. So your services have really supported me through my career. Um, 
<laughs> I'm also a founder of a company called Take 12, which provides immediate um, solutions as well as community and support for um, parents going into unpaid parental leave, um, which I consider oh. a crisis in oh. this country. Um, and specifically, maternity leave is what we're focusing on now. So as an advocate in this space, um, you know, I've found just being interviewed by the media and educating people that the, the gap is bigger than we like to admit. Okay. And, you know, with women specifically, I feel that when we're on the same side, we're unstoppable. But what's difficult in talking about these issues is that they, you know, the media, I feel like, really wants it to be partisan and wants it yeah. to be a political issue. So just, you know, as someone who's talking about it, what kind of advice can you give as far as unifying our voice to make this a nonpartisan issue and really not ostracize any woman that's Thank you so much for that issues. question and thank you for your awareness of that as having always been a challenge for us it's, to bring women together on this issue. And it's devastating. Sheila, you're the person I'm, who can do I'm it. I'm trying to pilot something actually in Massachusetts and I, I'm, I'm super busy but decided to join a board called the Massachusetts Competitiveness Partnership and it was previously called the Bolt. And from a branding perspective, more well understood, but basically it's sort of the sort of, I'm sorry to use the Uber, but Uber Chamber uh, of, of Massachusetts, the largest employer. And I, and I was concerned that they were inviting me to the board because I was going to be a token and as a woman. I, you know, that happens a lot, minority, Asian, all that. And, and I decided, you know what, who cares? I'm going to go uh, join that board. And um, at the lunch and the interview, I said to them, as long as you all support that I would like to pilot something in Massachusetts around womenomics and bringing and convening all the great programs in the state, uh, these incredible leaders, to come together and find out what's going to be the most effective to actually create Massachusetts as the beacon for the country to, to impact female participation in the workplace. And whatever those programs are. So, so, and I got emphatic, just rabid support from all the guys. In fact, uh, the guy who ran uh, MACP, Dan Connell, said he had never seen every uh, board member speak up and offer their female leader. And some actually had Roger Crandall, he's going to be embarrassed if he ever hears the story, but he came to see me. He is, he is the CEO of Mass Mutual, one of the largest insurance companies mm -hmm. in the country. White man came in to see me at care.com and he said, I am on that committee. What do I need to do to help? That's the kind of thing that I think. Yep. And, and so if you bring male leaders to also help convene female leaders, and I think that's going to be important. It's not just, I, I think the issue yep. that we have is the more that we classify care as a women's issue for women to address, I, I think we're, we're going to lose. Yeah, I, I, I think also what you were referencing is the division that tends to get divided between women who stay at home with their children and women yes. who work. And every time, is that, yeah, the mommy wars, that the, mo the mommy wars. And that has always been ultimately yes. our barrier to any real system change. Right. So, and you that know. I agree with, but again, how do we find ways to make it an economic argument that when you start yeah. to have other leaders come together, irrespective of gender or race, to say this is so critical and important, I think that will bring them together. Right. Gentlemen there in the blue jacket. <clears throat> Yes, thank you. Jeff Wright, a different question. Uh, we've heard some incredible moonshot stories of automation, uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, playing a part in the caregiving structure. How do you see that going forward? And how, how do you mitigate the job losses and, the, and, and potential destruction and human dignity that could result from that, uh, from that future? Thank you for that. That's a great question. Great especially about House here in Aspen with Elliot and Maureen Conway. Um, and I think it's a great conversation to have the, where we lend our voice to basically say that uh, caregivers are here to stay. It's the fastest growing job category mm. that um, we can have a lot of machine learning and AI and all of that, but, and robotics. But at the end of the day, 
this labor force is critical, and we have to find solutions. And um, are we going to leverage that technology? Uh, we just launched uh, an AI technology. Uh, we call her A to Z, uh, Ada, after Ada Lovelace. We're super excited about her. Um, and she just launched, um, and none of this is press, right? So <laughs> don't tweet about it. But um, but it's out there, so um, you can see it. Uh, but you know, we think about that a lot, but it's actually going to help facilitate, remove that uncomfortable conversation between families and caregivers that we did our user research. So there's power in technology, but we have to be thoughtful and conscious about it. Now, one of the things, um, you know, Travis at Uber was always clear from the beginning his mission, which is he intended to provide um, jobs, to increase jobs for, for drivers, but he was also very clear that he was going to use driverless cars. Now, it would have been nice if he actually then indicated the programs he would provide to help with job um, transformations for the drivers, given that he leveraged getting to profitability and growth, those drivers. So I think you know, businesses who decide that they're going to leverage labor in some way and going to transition need to invest. I really believe in figuring out ways in which there's, there's future training for these laborers so that, that we can find them future jobs. And I think mm -hmm. that, is, that is a responsibility of any business leader. And, and so I think, I think there's solutions around that yeah. about hiding you know, and being fearful of technology. Yeah, in fact, I think Jeff's point about this is one sector in which maybe technology is empowering, but yes. it's not taking away jobs, uh, mm -hmm. which is right. always a good argument in today's world. And there was a, one more hand, and I'd certainly, yes, please, you. Uh, and I can't see your face. Yeah. Hi. Um, Sheila, thank you very much, and thank you for such a great um, session today. I'm Vicki Amalfitano from Brigham and Women's in Boston, so Boston Proud. Yes. And I'd like to talk about the other end of the lifespan. Um, Care.com saved me in taking care of my elderly father down in the New York City area. Um, when he left the hospital and really wasn't eligible for any Medicare follow-up services and found wonderful people through care.com when the hospital down there couldn't help me. And I know hospitals really, really well. <laughs> and I've gone to my hospital, I've gone to Big Brigham yeah. and said, this is a great thing, this care.com, and we have lots and lots of patients who need this. Yeah. Um, and I've educated them, but I think it's a great opportunity mm -hmm. for um, our patients, for yeah. our families, um, to educate um, medical providers about care.com. Absolutely. In fact, Mark, Mark Weber from the Indian Force is here, and he's got a session of lunch if you want to stop by. And it's talking about our partnership, actually, of how do we get to um, uh, what we call at risk entities and um, healthcare systems. It's huge. Yep. Yeah. It's huge. Yes. And that is such a big opportunity, and, I, and we're running out of time, <laughs> Sheila, and I knew we would. Um, because the, the opportunity for the collaborations and partnerships between all these institutions, we didn't even get to hospitals and, and the medical institutions and what they could do. But um, I'd like to just say, I bet if we ask another 25 people in here, there'd be a care.com story, uh, as so many parents are benefiting from the work as is a whole caregiving uh, community of workers as well. So thank you very much for your leadership on this and for your innovation and openness to creating the kind of collaborations that will help us build a caregiving society. Thank you, thank you all. Very much.